All right. Let me give you some quick, uh, quick overview of my main messages. I think we're early days in the evaluation of what happened in Copenhagen and where we go afterwards. I think we've had two of those people in that picture talk so far. I'm the third and we're missing two to get to all five, right? Um, but I think one very important thing was this. This is a sort of a slightly tongue-in-cheek remark that farmers and environmentalists became friends. But I'll have a bit more to say about what I mean by that in just a second. Um, I actually think that it, the immediate outcomes of Copenhagen won't have any effect on what's going to happen in the next short while, short undefined, um, on things to address climate change and agriculture. I think the things that were in track, on track before we got to Copenhagen are still moving forward um, after Copenhagen. But um, in the, so a question mark, which we'll I'll come back to again, uh, uh, that David also alluded to briefly was this issue of the food security legislation in the United States. And is it time for, for us in our collective lobbying efforts to support agriculture and, its, uh, and, and, and dealing with climate change? Is it time for us to begin to think about the food security silo that exists out there? And unfortunately, this is not something that the Copenhagen uh, uh, agreements, the corridor, the negotiations really address, I think, appropriately, is there are some serious global public goods development activities that I think are critical, and I don't see them moving forward in a way that, well, at least I would like to see. So I'm going to focus on stuff that was happening outside the Bella Center with respect to agriculture and natural resources. And I think there was some good news that came out of that. Um, Agreement by everyone on key issues. Everyone I should probably put in quotes because, you know, there are only so many people you can get in the room at one time. But there were three events which brought together across the three events an incredibly diverse group of interested actors um, in the whole agriculture and natural resource uh, set of climate change activities. FAO had an activity um, on December 10th. Um, um, that was focused on agricultural mitigation, well, and beyond a little bit, I guess it's fair to say. Agriculture and Rural Development Day was a full day on December 12th, and Forest Day was uh, on December 13th. And I think it's a, a bit of a side note, it's interesting that uh, Secretary Vilsack attended two at least of the three events, and um, he spent basically about three, four, three-fourths of the day at Agricultural Rural Development Day after his presentation at lunchtime. He's hung around for the events afterwards. Um, and then um, out of those three events, there was a, a side event that was held for negotiators on December 14th um, where an agreed set of messages was presented to the negotiators and others. And I believe outside there was a copy of the one-page document that rep represented those uh, that, that reported those messages. I want to say just a bit about this because I think while it's perhaps not the very first time that you get this large group of people who the environmentalists and the farmers I suppose is a bit of a, an exaggeration but it's there's a large group of people who traditionally did not talk to each other or in some cases were actually antagonistic to each other agreeing on a set of principles going forward. So forestry and agriculture interactions. This is where poverty reduction, food security and climate change come together. And they have to be addressed in integrated fashion. You can't do this in these silos. So these communities, so in the context of negotiation, long-term cooperative action had a section on shared vision. F critical that food security be integrated into the LCA the language um, in order to open the door for adaptation and mitigation support. The climate, it urged the climate negotiators to move forward on this agricultural work program. Well, they didn't actually make that decision, but they made significant progress formally on it, and as I'll say in a minute, I think it's happening anyway. Um, look for agreement that red becomes, I suppose, red plus plus, that it include agriculture, forestry, and land uses um, in the activities associated with what the UNFCC calls red or red plus and include agriculture in the discussion of the land use and land use change. And I can never remember what all of those letters stand for anymore. I like Afolu better myself. Um, but include agriculture centrally as part of those discussions. And importantly, to contribute this cross-sectoral, to strengthen the cross-sectoral collaboration, 
cooperation to address the drivers of deforestation. How can you think about reducing deforestation if you don't think about the role of agriculture in driving deforestation? Enhancing sustainable agricultural growth and fostering rural development. Now, those are nice words, and those are the first time that I think in any kind of large public forum they've all been put together in one place and, and was saluted by a large number of the people that might not have saluted them a few years ago. Obviously, where do we go from here is a big question to which I don't have any answer, but I think we need to keep those groups talking to each other and pressing for action that they now see as important collectively across this wide range. Bill's already talked about this global alliance. In some sense, I see this as the work program, the official work program being taken, undertaken unofficially. You could view this as inputs to an eventual final work program that gets agreed to, but in some sense, the efforts that were needed to be done are moving forward, and, um, and that's, that's the moving forward part of this is extremely important. So my take on this is that the agricultural part of the negotiations or the agriculture and climate change interactions um, cup is half full. First of all, this unprecedented agreement across the various natural resource groups that are interested in the consequences of climate change for their part of the natural resource sector. The parties moving forward on elements of a work plan, even though that there's no formal agreement to have it yet. And substantial funding has been promised. Um, one of the things that Bill said, I think, two words about was the Green Fund, and, and David mentioned it. Um, it's unclear to me whether the $30 billion, which was a separate number and a separate part of the document, is going to go into the Green Fund or into the Adaptation Fund, which no one has actually said anything about it, um, and exists as actually part of the UNFCCC, with that last report about $200 million in it, um, or whether it's going to be part of various bilateral efforts. And I think we may never actually know how that accounting takes place. Um, but importantly, the voluntary carbon markets will continue working. And I think it's very important now for those of us who are interested in traditional agriculture, those who are interested in forests already have a leg up in terms of working with people on the buying side of, of credits um, to get forest pro processes, projects that transfer funds in a voluntary way. We need to now work more on the agriculture side of that, figuring out ways by which people who are interested in buying carbon credits can pay for activities in the developing world that involves small farmers and supports soil carbon uh, in particular or agroforestry practices. And then lastly, I want to say that the funding for food security can contribute to climate change resilience at a high level of, of, of analysis Pretty much anything you do for food security, you're also doing to contribute to climate change resilience. But there are things you can do for food security that will improve the contribution to climate change adaptation and mitigation as well. And so I think as we think about the process, particularly in the U.S., about what we can do about climate change in the U.S., it's not just a matter of focusing centrally on climate change, but it's about the important role that we can do in other parts of U.S. government activities that will contribute to climate change even if they wear a different hat. Um, I asked Bill after he was done talking, so I said, Bill, so the, you, you view the cup as half full, right? He says, oh, it's more than half full, right? Um, um, but we'll we'll um, have to continue that discussion later about the designation of the level of the water in the cup, but uh, as David said, there are concerns about whether consensus international negotiations can achieve meaningful results. And I think there's huge issues uh, with respect to the U.S. domestic politics on climate change, and they're not purely about climate change, they're also about health care, and they're about jobs. And so I think that we would do ourselves, again, those of us who are interested in doing something about climate change adaptation in developing countries, a disservice if we focus only on climate change. There are many other venues in which we can think about activities that will contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation that are not necessarily labeled as such. And the food security legislation that might be moving forward is, a, is I think, probably the next best bet on that. <coughs> Missing in uh, much of this discussion are global public goods. 
I'm very skeptical that the proposed approaches to red, for example, that involve some kind of measurement of the current rates of deforestation and activities that would reduce those rates of deforestation, we actually can do a credible job of monitoring, reporting, and verification with the data sources that we have. The same sorts of things can be said about agricultural uh, mitigation efforts. And so we need to do a much better uh, job of collecting data than we do. And that's clearly a global public good activity. It's global data that we need, not individual country data. We need to do a much better job of sharing national and local data that is collected, that are collected, across the globe. Because a practice that a farmer in Bolivia does today might be extremely useful to a farmer in Tanzania 20 years from now. So long as we're only collecting those data on a national basis and we don't have a mechanism by which we can share globally, it won't get shared. Next steps. Preparation for agricultural adaptation. Those of you who have heard me talk about this before have heard me say that the best, first best thing to do is to have good development policies and programs. That will contribute the higher incomes that f farmers need in order to be resilient to any kind of uncertainty that might come down the pike. But we need to spend a significant chunk of change on revitalizing national research and extension systems. We may not want to do the same old, same old, but we certainly need to do some of the same old, same old that we got rid of over the last 20 years as funding for national research and extension systems declined. But in the 21st century, with the IT revolution, unprecedented ways of sharing information, we can think about using that 21st century technology to go along with the old ways that we have had to develop and disseminate information to farmers to deal with the incredible need for productivity increases that will come out of population and income growth regardless of climate change and then layering climate change on top of that. And then the last thing is global data collection and information sharing. On the ag agricultural mitigation side, research and testing of cost-effective soil carbon, I really should expand that to say uh, a variety of ways of reducing emissions, in particular methane and nitrous oxide emissions. We can't have a business as usual um, with nitrous oxide emissions uh, associated with nitrogen application if we're going to need to increase food production by 50 percent. We've got to, to use the language of the healthcare debate, bend that curve so that yields go up whereas nitrous oxide emissions don't. Thinking about management practices, measurement, and institutional innovation. I'd end with the thought, remember Deng Xiaoping's famous cat, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's black or white, it's whether it catches the mice. Climate change is a huge problem facing us all. Let's not get hung up on labels. Let's make sure that the activities that are needed to reduce its effects and to, to increase mitigation get started as soon as possible.